Earlier this week, Apple unveiled macOS 26, also known as macOS Tahoe. And while it might not be quite as groundbreaking as iPadOS 26, and perhaps doesn't bring quite as many headline features as iOS 26, I actually think this might be the most useful of the three updates in terms of day-to-day -day improvements. There's a lot here that's going to make life easier for Mac users, especially if you're someone who uses your Mac for work or productivity. So in this video, I want to walk you through the features that have impressed me the most so far. Quick reminder before we start, this is just a preview of what's coming based on the developer beta of macOS Tahoe. I wouldn't recommend installing this on your main Mac. If you're curious to try it out, wait for the public beta, which should land in about a month, or better yet, hold off until September when the final version is released to everyone. But with all that said, let's get into it. Without a doubt, the most significant change coming to macOS this year is the visual overhaul that Apple has rolled out across all of its operating systems, something they're calling liquid glass. I've been able to test the new look on all of the platforms, and honestly, I think it's here on the Mac where the changes feel the most dramatic. Yes, it is still very noticeable on the iPhone and the iPad, but on the Mac, it's a pretty drastic shift, and personally, I think it's a shift in the right direction. You see it everywhere. The dock now has updated app icons with more rounded corners and a kind of glossy, almost glassy look. Finder windows have even more rounded corners and a layered appearance, and the menu bar at the top is now completely transparent, blending in with your wallpaper. It is a subtle change, but it does have the effect of making your screen feel slightly larger. Of course, all of this is going to be subjective. I've already seen comments on my iPhone and iPad videos from people saying that they're not a fan of the redesign. I actually really like it, and based on what I've seen so far, most people seem to feel the same. But I'd love to know what you think of the design changes in macOS Tahoe, so drop me a comment and let me know. I also really like the fact that you can now customize the icons on your Mac in a way that's quite similar to what Apple introduced on the iPhone last year. In dark mode, the icons in your dock automatically update to reflect the darker theme, which just makes everything feel a bit more cohesive. You can even make your desktop widgets translucent or tinted to match your wallpaper. Apple actually showed a great example of this in the WWDC demo. There was a dark MacBook Pro with a dark wallpaper and a matching color theme, and it looked brilliant. If you're someone who enjoys personalizing your setup and you're happy to spend a bit of time playing around with these options, I think you're going to really enjoy the level of customization that is now possible on the Mac, and I'm definitely a fan. If you've already installed the macOS beta, the more eagle-eyed among you might have noticed that the launch pad is now completely gone from the dock. In its place, you'll see a new tile next to Finder simply called Apps. When you tap into this, you'll see that the entire layout looks very different to what we've had before. Rather than giving you a manually managed, slightly chaotic grid of apps, this new setup is designed to surface the apps that you might actually want to use. Right at the top, you'll see a set of suggested apps the macOS thinks you might need, and in my short time using it, those suggestions have actually been pretty good. What's interesting is that these suggestions don't just include Mac apps, they also include apps from your iPhone that can be accessed via iPhone mirroring, so it really ties the Apple ecosystem together nicely. Below that, your apps are grouped into categories like utilities, social, productivity, entertainment, and so on. You can view these as icons or switch to a list view if that's more your thing. If you prefer more of a traditional app library layout, you can change the view from categories to name and you'll get an alphabetized list of every app on your system. Of course, you can also just type the name of an app into the search bar at the top if you're looking for something specific. This whole approach is a pretty big shift from the old launch pad and I can imagine it might take a bit of getting used to for some people, but personally, I haven't used Launchpad properly in years. I just rely on Spotlight to open most of my apps, so this feels like a really welcome improvement for how I use my Mac. Also, and this is a very minor change, when you swipe up with four fingers on a trackpad on your Mac or use Control and the up arrow on a keyboard, it still takes you to Mission Control. It's still referred to as Mission Control in the Mac settings, but I've noticed that it now functions almost identically to App Expose on the iPad. So it does make me wonder whether Apple might rename this at some point in the future. That said, if you're someone who uses Mission Control a lot on your Mac, don't worry. The functionality is still there and it works exactly the same as before. By the way, if you enjoy tips and tricks videos for the Mac like this, you should definitely check out my dedicated training hub, Mac Essentials Plus, which is launching in just over a week's time. 
It's got more than 200 lessons for the Mac, and each lesson includes a quick video, a step-by-step -step guide, and a downloadable PDF. It covers every aspect of your Mac, with new content being added all the time. And if you'd like to learn more, just scan the QR code that you can see on screen or follow the link in the description of this video. Control Center has had a much needed glow up in macOS Tahoe, not only matching the look of what you see on the iPhone and iPad, but also bringing over the same level of functionality and customization. So if you're already used to managing this on your iPhone, it's gonna feel very familiar here on the Mac too. When you tap into it, you'll see the familiar edit controls button at the bottom, and you can scroll through and choose from a wide selection of controls to add. Something else I noticed is that the drag bars that you see on the iPhone aren't visible here on the Mac, but it's actually even easier to manage. You can just right click on any of the controls and choose between a small control, which is the single circular icon, a medium one by two control, which is my personal preference, or a large two by two tile. My only complaint and something I was a bit surprised by is that there's only one page of control center available. On the iPhone, you can swipe between multiple pages, but here on the Mac, you run out of space pretty quickly, especially if you've opted for a few of the larger controls. There doesn't seem to be any way to add extra pages at the moment, which feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. Hopefully that's something that Apple can address in a future update. If you're enjoying the content here, why not sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is all about tech news and tips delivered free to your inbox each Friday. Sign up via the QR code on screen or the link in the description. Spotlight Search on the Mac has had what feels like a complete ground up redesign. And to be honest, it really needed it. I've always thought Spotlight was good, but not quite on the same level as some of the third party tools out there. After a bit of time playing around with the new version, I think this might finally be the kind of search tool that your Mac deserves. You still access it in the same way, press command and spacebar. And at first glance, it looks exactly the same. But the second you move your cursor, you'll now see four new buttons appear on the right. Apps, files, actions, and clipboard. So first off, you can use Spotlight exactly as you did before. Just type in your search term and your Mac will try to return the most relevant results. Straight away, I noticed that the relevance and accuracy of the results seems much better than in previous versions of macOS. But this is where the new functionality kicks in. Now you've got filters right below the search bar that let you narrow the results down to things like messages, emails, calendar events, and more. This makes it so much quicker to find exactly what you're looking for. Then you've got the four dedicated buttons on the right. Apps and files are fairly self-explanatory, but it's the new actions button that's really interesting. When you tap into this, you get a list of actions that your Mac can run, essentially shortcuts like sending a message, starting a timer, writing a new note, and much more. It works with both Apple's built-in apps and some third-party apps too. Each of these can also be assigned a quick key. So if you often create a new voice memo, for example, you could assign it the key M-E-M, -E mem. Then every time you open Spotlight and type mem, it will launch that action straight away. And finally, the clipboard. This is a proper clipboard history that lets you look back up to eight hours. It's one of those features that Mac users have wanted for years, and it's something I've previously had to install third-party apps to get. Now that it's built in, it's gonna be so useful. For me, I often copy the same information into different fields when uploading videos to YouTube, and having this clipboard history will make that whole process so much easier. I haven't installed macOS Tahoe on my main machine yet, just a secondary one, and honestly, this is the one feature that I think I'm gonna miss the most over the next few months until the official release. If you use the Shortcuts app on your Mac, you'll be pleased to see that there have been some pretty big changes, particularly around Apple Intelligence. Provided you're using a Mac that supports Apple Intelligence, you'll now see a dedicated Apple Intelligence section when creating a new shortcut. From here, you can bring in some of the usual Apple Intelligence tools like the writing features or Image Playground. But what I think is gonna be more interesting for most people is the Use Model command. This gives you three distinct options. You can run the action on your device using Apple Intelligence. You can choose to use private cloud compute, or you can run the shortcut using ChatGPT. I've only just started exploring this, and I think it probably deserves its own full video because there's clearly a lot of potential here. One of the examples that Apple showed off at WWDC was a shortcut that could gather together images, notes, and transcriptions from a lecture, and then use private cloud compute to compare them and see if anything important had been missed in the written notes. 
If you're a student, that kind of automation could be incredibly useful. I already mentioned in my iPadOS preview video how pleased I was to see that the journal app had come to the iPad. And I said that because typing on my iPhone isn't something I particularly enjoy doing. So I tended not to use the journal app in the way that it was really designed to be used. The idea of it coming to the iPad felt like a great step forward, but I must have missed the part of the keynote where they mentioned that it was also coming to the Mac, which is even better news. So now, no matter what device you're using, whether it's your iPhone, iPad, or Mac, you can access the journal app. From what I can see, it functions pretty much exactly the same on the Mac as it does on the iPad. So there's nothing especially new to report in terms of features or layout. The only downside I've found so far is that on the beta, at least, it seems to be the buggiest app that I've used so far. But that's exactly what beta testing is for. And I'm sure Apple will have those issues ironed out before launch in September. If you game on your Mac, Apple has now made the experience much easier with the addition of a dedicated games app. This is designed to replace Game Center and bring all of your gaming content into one central place. I'm not really much of a Mac gamer myself, but I can definitely see the appeal here, especially as Apple Silicon continues to get more powerful with each new generation. What really stands out to me is the idea of paying for a title once and being able to play it seamlessly across your iPhone, iPad, and Mac. That kind of cross-platform access is exactly the kind of convenience that Apple is clearly aiming for with this app. They've also said that they're working on better integration and improved stability for third-party controllers, which is obviously a welcome improvement as well. So there you go. Those are the main things that have stood out to me so far in macOS 26 or macOS Tahoe based on my early time with the developer build. Of course, I'll be spending a lot more time with this operating system over the coming weeks to dig into every little change, feature, and tweak. And I'll be sharing plenty more content on that closer to launch later in the year. But from what you've seen so far, what are you most impressed by? Was there anything you were hoping Apple would add that didn't make the cut? Drop me a comment and let me know. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video.